Hi, everyone. So the slides are there. Second. Oh, okay. My bad. So I forgot to change these topics. So it should be today will be about pre-trained pre -trained language models. So it's the first class of the, um, I would say the second half of the class. So we spend the a, a bit more than first half of the semester on the, what I usually call the pre birth era or pre pre-trained language model era, because a lot of things changed around 2018, 2019-ish, so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it will be a lot of um, interesting history now on. I mean, um, it's kind of history class in some sense. So I'm going to actually post the quiz, as always. One second. 14. Okay, so I'm just I'm launching the oh my bad. So launching the quiz. You have three minutes. 
Okay, so the three minutes up. Now let's do first announcements. So I'm really sorry for the delay. Yeah, it's the, um, I'm currently traveling. So I think it has been a bit hard for me to keep up with the dates. So I'll um, upload this today and it'll be due in two weeks. So, um, in any case, you won't be having less deadline and less time to work on it. Um, there will be no lecture on Wednesday because I currently um, they're, they're, I'm organizing workshop at UNLP and I think I'll need to um, actually spend time on it. So, um, so no lecture on Wednesday. Oh, and I think someone is not muted, so Please check if you're not muted and then please mute. Unless of course you want to say something. Always welcome to actually ask questions. Okay, so let's go for the recap. All right, so in, in our last lecture, we talked about the language model and I said that the, the exact definition of language model is creating a model that has that gives you the probability distribution over strings of text. So what that means is that it's basically a function that gets uh, some string as the input and outputs a probability that's between zero and one. And of course, because this is a probability distribution over all the strings, that means if you sum all these up, all possible strings, then this has to be 1.0. So, which means this will be a very small value in general, right? And it's measuring how likely is a sentence over all possible strings. And I said that this is, this is actually really useful, right? What, where would you use that if you know that certain string has a certain probability? There is actually one use case, which is what is the most likely next word? And this allows us to generate text in a conditioned way. So, well, I mean, you can also generate text without a condition, but where it really actually um, becomes really important is that suppose you're given um, a few words to start with, then you want to predict what the next word is. And if you want to do that, you just need a language model to do that because you basically have all possible strings that you basically first enumerate all possible strings that has this prior um, fragment, sentence fragment as the first few tokens and uh, one more token after that. So you basically have a, so suppose that your um, prior sentence fragment is a P and then you want to see what's the next most likely word X, then you just have to measure the probability of a P and X. Uh, of course, we have to attach those two. And then you just want to, what, argmax find the X that actually has the highest probability of a P and X combined, right? So that's why you can use the, the language model to predict the most likely next word. And if you want to actually um, be more precise about what your probability of X be given the pr prior P, then it will be, what is the probability of X given P? This is exactly, I'll use the quotation to um, indicate the concatenation. Probably P and X combined over probab uh, probability of just P. And so that's convenient, right? So that's a convenient way of um, define the, defining the next, what's the most likely next word. Of course, this um, the argmax of um, 
this probability is actually equivalent to this argument of um, probability of px. And mathematically, it's very easy to see because your denominator stays the same, whatever the x is. So here, the denominator, denom denominator is this one. <coughs> okay. So that's great. And then whenever we create a model, we need a evaluation metric to measure how good the model is. And when we are evaluating language model, we usually use the evaluation metric called perplexity. And perplexity is measured as what's the probability of this entire sequence. Suppose the sequence length is n, and then, so this is language model, right? This part is language model. And then after you computed that number, then you do, you take the part, you take it to the power of a negative one over n. And what does negative one over n mean? This is equivalent to one over nth root of um, this probability. So negative basically, you know, passes the probability to the denominator. And then one over n is just this uh, square root, but instead of square root, you basically take the nth root. And it's, it's actually more important to understand conceptually what this means, because that will help you to understand when a certain language model has certain perplexity, it gives you more intuition what that means. So I said that it means that um, suppose that the it's it's usually the easiest if you actually think of this as a some uniform model. So suppose that our pro our language model is just uniform, which means it just assigns the uniform probability over all possible vocab. Then we know that what will be the probability of w1 to wn? It will be just in the case of uniform. Um, your probability of W1 to Wn will be just, well, because W1 will have a probability of one over V uniform, right? So, and it's power to the power of N, right? So, which is just V, v to the power of negative N. And what happens uh, actually, um, so n is actually should be uppercase. Then if you put this into this perplexity function, then p p of uh, w just becomes v to the power of n over negative one over n, and this just cancels out, right? It just becomes v. So it just means that well. If you have a uniform model, then your perplexity will be exactly the vocab size. So in other words, the perplexity means how good you are compared to the uniform model, which is just like very trivial model, like baseline model. And in other words, you can also think of it as how much can you reduce your search space or I mean your option space. So let's say that V is here 10,000. And then suppose your models perplexity is like 10. That means that even though the vocab size is 10,000, you are able to reduce, <clears throat> reduce the um, search space for, for the model to only up to 10. So that's at least you're pretty sure that um, your model will be getting the correct word in the top 10 choices, something like that. So that's a, a, pro that's a rough way to think of this. And um, also the, the, the reason why they put N here is also clear, right? Because by putting N, you effectively removes the um, number getting smaller due to a longer sentence. So, which means perplexity will not be 
worse just because sentence is longer because you actually take the length into account. In fact, it's actually, um, it's safer to say that the perplexity will be lower, which means lower is good here, right? Because um, you don't want to be too, too high. Um, will be lower when the N is high. Why is that? Well, that's because if you have larger number of, um, I mean, um, well, you can think of this way. I mean, it's not, it's, it's, uh, it's intuitively, suppose that your sentence length is one, then the, what you, your model can do is like, just depending on the statistics, right? How often each word appears. But if your word length becomes two, then you have at least one, um, what, when the first word is given, then you have a better chance of getting the second right. So if your words length gets bigger, then it is likely that a good model will be uh, able to achieve a lower perplexity. Okay, so how do we create a language model? So most basic way to create a language model is n-gram language model. And we, we, talk, we talk about the, the easiest way is just create a unigram language model, which is how likely each individual word to appear. So in that case, it's basically, we're just assuming that the language model has um, no dependency on previous word. You just, every time you try to predict the next word, you don't consider what your current word is. You just try to predict the best next word based on your training data statistics, how often each word appears. It becomes a bit more, uh, a bit smarter if you move to bigram language model, because in bigram language model, now you start to see the previous word, not previous words, just the previous word. And in trigram, trigram language model, then you now see two previous words, because now you're counting how many times the three word happens. And that three word is basically um, what's the likelihood of the, the last word given the previous two words. So in trigram language model, you're seeing previous two words. In n-gram language model, you're actually seeing the previous n minus one words to predict the current word. And smoothing techniques oftentimes used to avoid the unseen n-grams during inference time. And what that means is because we, in, in the NGRAM language model, we depend on the statistics in the training data, how many times certain unigram, two gram or three gram appears. And that means your, if your test data and training data don't have many overlap NGRAMs, then those NGRAMs will, be not, will not be useful at all, right? because you only can uh, handle the n-grams that have appeared in training data. That's how you actually can assign some probability distribution or probability mass to that. And then if you don't see that in, the, in your test data, then it's basically no use. And as n increases, if the n is really high, that means, for instance, let's say n is 10, then you're saying that you want to see a certain uh, sentence fragment where these 10 words appear consequent, uh, consec well, I mean, they appear consecutively, right? Uh, and that's only when you actually, when this, this 10 gram or the uh, n gram when n equal 10 matters. And that's very rare unless your training data is very large. So that's why when n gets large, your language model becomes not so effective because you will not be seeing that n-grams a lot anyways during test time, what you have seen in training time. Your, most of the n-grams you see in your, uh, at test time will not have appeared in training time. So they'll be all like onk. And that's why the increasing just n is not a good, good thing to do. And what people usually do is then they instead create a model that has it's combination of um, you know unigram, bigram, trigram, a trigram, etc. until ngram, so that it can fall back to um, the previous 
lower grams if it hasn't it doesn't have that n-gram in test time. And we also talk about the neural language model. So neural language model, you can view it as just sig to sig without an encoder, so just the decoder side. And it's also important to note that the modern neural language models are mostly based on transformers decoder. Although, of course, um, people have also done language model with LSTMs, which we will see today. So it was also work, working pretty well, except that LSTMs, we know there are some limitations, especially long-term dependency. You cannot access um, terms in a distant location effectively. So, but, um, but still, LSTM can be also used for, I mean, they were actually the original um, models that were used in sig to sig like GRU. So um, it, it's more, it, um, LSTMs were first used to for the lang neural language model and then later were replaced by transformers these days. But we talk about a few other um, tricks or uh, important regularizations in training, especially transformer-like models. So actually batch normalization is a very popular trick a very popular normalization in image domain where in the enabled the advancement of um, very deep layers, a very high number of layers, like 100 plus layers of neural networks in um, image classification. And we also talk about the um, layer norm, which is developed because, or I mean, was popularized because the best norm didn't really work well on the NLP domain. And layer norm was proved to be working pretty well in transformer architecture. And it's very still popular. Although it's not theoretically clear why there is such difference between batch norm and layer norm. So I'm skipping the details. Um, and um, also talk about teacher forcing where teacher forcing is your, when you're training your decoder, you actually try to give the model the prediction. I mean, they try to define a loss to be the difference between the model's prediction and the actual uh, ground truth at each time step. And that's good, but then the problem is then um, what's the input to the, the that time step? The input is um, in teacher forcing the ground truth previous token. Whereas this actually is different, different in the inference time because during the inference time, you are not actually using the ground truth, truth token, which is unknown, but you're actually feeding the previous time steps output. So there's difference between the inference and training and that causes bias. Here we call it exposure bias because the ground truth is never observed during inference. But, and there were actually a few papers really uh, talking about this in the early sick to sick era, but then at the end, what people now agree um, mostly is that this bias is not really that problematic. It doesn't severely hurt the performance. Although that causes some really weird issues in um, sick to sick or degenerative models. For instance, like um, you will see in some cases, the model degenerates, which means that actually just keeps generating the same token sometimes. And teacher forcing is known to be one of the causes because the, there, is a, there was a bias between the training and inference time. And then, um, you know, um, that uh, for some somehow the difference actually caused the model to really degenerate basically while it was decoding because it has never seen that kind of pattern during training. There are some tricks to resolve that, but still um, teacher forcing is so powerful that actually uh, people use that mostly. One might consider using reinforcement learning to avoid bias, but then the problem is that um, oftentimes in machine learning, if bias is sufficiently low, really what matters is the variance. So if you have to choose between the variance and bias, well, number one thing is of course, to make sure the bias is sufficiently low. I mean, if, if bias is really high, I mean, um, you're, you know, it's like, you, you can just create a, 
high bias, zero variance loss very easily. Um, you can just have a zero variance because loss doesn't change at all. You're just like creating a dumb, dummy loss function that doesn't even depend on the model. So you cannot ignore bias at all. I mean, you cannot bias entirely, I'm saying, but then it is possible to, I mean, it, the, when the bias gets sufficiently low, it is um, a consensus that the bias doesn't become important anymore. And what then matters is actually having low enough variance. So, but then still maybe if you want to avoid exposure bias. And then there are largely two ways. One is you can try to enumerate all possible outputs and compute the gradient. Well, because teaser forcing is one way to approximate the gradient, but if you want to exactly compute the gradient of your um, model with, with respect to these examples, then you can just actually enumerate all possible outputs and then compute the gradient. And of course, uh, define it as a probabilistic model. But then in this case, what happens is, can you enumerate all possible outputs? No, because um, I think we also saw this in the today's quiz. There are uh, V to the power of T possible outputs where V is the vocab size and T is the length. So that's not good. So number two is we can try to approximate number one via sampling, such as the policy gradient. This has no bias, but very high variance. You can also use other various RL methods, actor critic, low bias, low variance. Although um, number one, I don't think there isn't, I don't think there is really a work, some a RL method in decoding that works really well that everyone's using it. So um, that's one reason. And number two reason is that, um, well, it's out of scope. So if you're interested in this direction, of course, um, I'm not saying that um, such decoding mechanism is not good. Uh, I think people haven't found one that's good enough that people, a lot of people use it despite its um, higher complexity because RL training is usually harder than just teacher forcing. But if you're interest number two, consider taking RL class. And um, we talk about the search strategies during decoding. So we talk about how um, exhaustive search is really not viable. Again, this will be will require to enumerate b to the power of t possible combinations. Greedy searches, uh, whereas uh, it's very fast, it's O of t because you just have to choose one at the top, but then uh, usually it can be local minima, suboptimal. Beam search, if your beam size is a k, then this actually means uh, O of k t, and it's usually pretty efficient if k is sufficiently low and also quite uh, good enough that people actually use this a lot. Okay, we talk about beam search. So, okay, so we wrapped up last class saying that we have covered all these things. And now we are moving to from the vanilla training to uh, pre-training and fine tuning paradigm. Um, so this will be most, mostly the, the second half of the class will be mostly about this. And in the last lecture, I'll, I'll briefly talk about, last two lectures, I'll, I'll briefly talk about in-context learning, which is getting quite popular in last uh, one year. And it can be considered as a bit different paradigm compared to the um, fine tuning paradigm. Okay, so I'm going to now close the quiz. It was actually a really long, I think, um, overview, but I think it was a really important lecture last time. So I, I just wanted to come at enough time so that everyone has at least a good understanding of these materials. I'm going to download and then share just one second.
Okay. Okay, so I'm gonna share the results. All right, so question number one. What is the perplexity of a 10 word sentence if we use a language model with uniform distribution over the vocab and the vocab size is 500? So let's try the math. Okay, so what is the perplexity? Well, this will be probability of W1 to here W10. And we know that the um, if you if the language model just has an uniform distribution over the vocab for each word, then this will be just um, each word's probability will be just um, one over V, right? Do you agree? And then you just multiply this 10 times. Oh, wait, so perplexity is probably of this one over uh, to the power of negative one over n, right? And then you just do this negative one over, um, I mean, n is here 10, so negative one over 10, and that will be what? V to the power of 10, negative one over 10. So you cancel out 10 and the negative one basically brings the V back to numerator. So this just becomes V where the V is 500, right? So uh, the answer is 500. So it's not 50. Okay, so um, number two. So I think number one, most more people got it wrong than correct. So um, it would be good for you to actually review this. Number two, true or false, an engram language model with very high and is not preferred because of its high computational cost. So maybe this was not the, the best question, but still um, I think it's rather false than true because we're not worried about the computational cost when n is high because uh, in, the, in the worst case, even if n is really high, you just have to store your corpus, training corpus, and you, you, you can just hash them. So it'll be really fast. Memory-wise, maybe a bit uh, cumbersome, but not too much, right? But then really the issue is not the computational cost. The problem is that it's too sparse, that during inference time, anyways, most of your n-grams, if n is high, will be unk because you have never seen them. So this will be false. 500. And number three. So I think more people got it wrong than right. And number three, what is the time complex of exhaustive search decoding for a sentence like T and vocab size V? This is just a V times V times V times V and T. So it's a V to the power of T. Right. So I think 55% um, of you got it right. So it's great. But I think this quiz was a bit difficult, difficult than other quizzes. All right. Okay, so we're a bit behind, but um, it's okay. I think I'll be able to cover the everything today. So, um, so now let's recap what we have been what, what we have been doing for the last the first half of the semester we were doing basically a very canonical vanilla i mean there are several ways to call this supervised learning where it's actually very well defined mathematically because it's just maximum likelihood estimation right for the target task and that's great because um well it's very um even if even for the six to six it's not exactly a maximum likelihood estimation, but still you, you actually at least have a target, which is MLE. And uh, of course, if you do teacher forcing, it doesn't become exactly the MLE because of the bias, but still, you are still aware of your target function. It's just because of the computational complexity, you are not getting there. So you can say that that's still also MLE, at least in terms of what we're aiming for. But um, this has a lot of limitations. Well, that because that's because in this case we're in, in the supervised learning we're assuming that 
your model will be just trained on your given data. So if this is text classification, you have input text and output label. Like, let's say it was a movie review, then it's either positive or negative. Then you just your model just actually is being trained on that. And that's actually from the human's perspective, for instance, it's a bit weird, right? Because when we teach a human to do some task, we're not assuming that the human doesn't know anything. Human has some previous knowledge, some prior knowledge or something that uh, she or he learned over the course of um, you know, life. And then, well, now if the human is not allowed to use that, probably human will not do well. But then we are kind of forcing the model to do really well. And that's why we need a lot of examples for these models. Humans would not need so many examples like 10,000, 100,000 to actually classify between positive and negative reviews. So which means, which means if we are actually trying to, you know, um, borrow some ideas from how humans would learn. It makes more sense for models, if possible, to learn from something before actually they are given the task. And being able to transfer the knowledge that the models have learned in the pre uh, in, in, uh, previously to the target task that it's, they are being asked to solve right now would be nice, right? And that's actually called transfer learning. And transfer learning is, well, we can try to define it mathematically, but still it's not super clear because, well, it, it's, it's not clear where the really advantage is coming from, except that th there is some similarity between the um, previous task and the current task. So it's, I think, anyways, I think at some point, when you're doing deep learning, the intuition becomes as important as or more important than mathematics. So um, it's something that you have to just admit, or you can also try to look for some work that's try, trying to actually define transfer learning mathematically. But uh, it's easier to think of it as, okay, in transfer learning, in supervised learning, you're just given um, data where the you're basically given the input and output data, right? X1, X2. Um, so you're given N training data, and then you basically try to map the relationship between the X and Y. That's simple in the supervised learning case, but then it becomes a bit more difficult because in transfer learning case, you have a um, task one, or it's some, it could be a lot of task, and then you basically create a model in this task. This will be also something that's involving training data, right? And you create a model and then you somehow use this in your task two. In this case, your task two is the main task. And then you want to benefit from using this model trained on task one compared to not using it at all. So that's the concept of transfer learning. So we're gonna have a, a quick five minute break and then come back and then cover the uh, rest of the lectures. So um, see you soon.
Okay, welcome back. Okay, so as I said, transfer learning is a bit different in that you have uh, some previous task that the model was first trained on, and then you want to somehow bring that model to the current task and then leverage it. Of course, how we leverage that is the question, right? In fact, in image domain, there was a very popular way to do this transfer learning called fine tuning. So in fact, this is so popular right now that when you talk about transfer learning, I think people usually just um, use it, the word as a synonym to fine tuning, but technically they're actually, one is actually the more general, general, general term than the, the other. The transfer learning and fine tuning is a, just one type of transfer learning that is very popular. So what is fine tuning? So, so in the image domain, what people did was, okay, you're, there was a very large data set for image classification that given an image classifies into say um, hundred different classes, right? And then when this model was on, trained on this data set, they were achieving 80%, 90% accuracy, for instance, top five accuracy. Then let's say that the model, we, let's say this, that, that was task one. So we have a task one here. That was a image classification. And this basically the model was trained on this um, image classification data set, input image and output label. And let's call that M1. And then what image, and then of course there are different kinds of tasks in image domain, right? Not just the classification, but maybe you want to do object detection, which is not just classifying the image, but you're exactly locating where the object is. So it's very useful for, for instance, object tracking or person tracking. This, this will be very, it's a very important technology for um, self-driving cars, right? Because I mean, if you're using vision instead of the LiDAR. So then how people do, so suppose we're, we wanna do object object detection, then how people did, how, pe how the image people did was, they basically just brought this M1, which means architecture plus the parameters. So. That's what people usually call the model, or I mean, well, um, there are different ways to call that. But anyways, um, so we have this uh, parameters of the model, which so it's architecture with the parameters, and then we just create a same, well, in the, in the, in the first part, because we have the same input, it, whether it's an image classification or the object detection, we have the same input, we just have different outputs, right? So what people did was, okay, just let's just create the architecture, just like uh, image classification up to here. And then also in this architecture, although we are trying to do object detection, let's bring the M1 parameters to this model. So instead of initializing the model with random values, what people usually do in the, unsuper I mean, in the supervised learning, they initialize the model's parameters with the M1's trained parameters. And of course, this part, the, this part was randomly initialized. So now you have a model that's half-baked and of course, this won't work initially because um, they're not synced at all, right? Randomly initialized parameters will not be, are not synced with the the um, the parameters you brought from the task one. But what was amazing is that this works so better than just trying to train everything from scratch. Randomly initialized parameters. So that's what that's what people call fine tuning because you have already tuned your model and then you bring that, that to this new model and then you tune it further. So that's fine tuning. 
And that became dominant in around um, 2015 and 2016. Everyone was using this. It was basically the building blocks for, uh, for every image domain applications or tasks. And you might ask them, how about NLP? And well, there was a similar thing back then, 20, 2015, 2014, which, is, which was word embedding. And we talk about this briefly, that um, if you can actually somehow create a good word embeddings, then they can be used anywhere. And then you can also fine tune those. And they are very easy to use in that just replace word embedding primers with the pre-trained vectors. And also you can fine tune them um, or freeze them, either is fine. But there were some apparent limitations, right? Because if you just use the word embeddings, then you might be able to know the meaning of the word, but then what really matters in NLP is what's the relationship between the words syntactically and semantically. So that leads us to the community, the community in the NLP to think about, okay, what can we do to do the same thing or the image classification equivalent in NLP? The first, well, obvious answer could be, can, can we do the same thing, for instance, text classification? So we have like uh, you know, data in the sentiment, um, sentiment classification data. Can we use that and then train the model on that data set and then use it on any other task? And in fact, it didn't work well. So apparently it was not so effective and um, there are several Several, several, I think, explanations for that. One is that image classification is usually one of the, um, it's really hard task, whereas the text classification is not hard enough. So this task has to be hard enough to learn something. Or in other words, it's maybe safe to say that, um, I mean, not, not probably safe, but then one way to think about it is that task one has to be sufficiently hard or harder than the uh, test two. I think I have a, a few questions being asked, okay. Okay, is it signal really bad? Okay, do you hear me? So, um, Okay, so I will continue doing, um, I mean, I'll, I'll act if, if this happens again, then maybe I can uh, go for a quick pause to see if, how many people are experiencing difficulties. Okay, maybe there was some issue with the uh, Zoom server. Oh, I see, okay. All right, so let me continue. So, where do you live off? So, yeah, so, I mean, although there were a few um, successful cases, one was, for instance, question answering, um, where the task one the, was question answering and then it was fine tuned on classification. And it actually makes sense because um, the question answering is, could be thought as a bit more difficult task than um, classification. I mean, difficulty is probably not a good word. What I mean by it is like, it's more, I would say, it requires the model to be more, I would say, learn more things than, or be more complex. Okay, I'll turn off the video. All right, so um, in the worst case, I think um, you can 
the the uh, recording has no issues probably so you can view the video on the youtube so okay um that was um that was the case for um, nlp that we didn't find a good task that we can use for transfer learning and there were actually a few people who are then thinking, oh, how about language model? Because language model at least uh, is quite a difficult task, right? And it requires model to learn a lot of things. And one characteristic of a language model compared to image classification is that really, really big advantage is that it's self-supervised. And um, one thing to note is sometimes this is called unsupervised. And I think it's more correct to say is self-supervised. I think there was some debate on like Facebook and Twitter, whether we should call this self or unsupervised. And unsupervised kind of uh, has a connotation that this is not supervised. So I think people now call it self-supervised that we don't require label to supervise it. Um, so it ha we have practically unlimited training data and it's also hard enough to learn meaningful linguistic features. But, um, and now we think, especially if you know what happened after that, it's, it, it looks very obvious, like why haven't, why not language model? It's a very obvious choice. But then, in fact, it was not obvious back then. People were not, you know, I think everything always in scientific advancement is that the, it, it, it's, it's, it's obvious when actually it happens after it happened. So it wasn't obvious back then. And it took about three more years for NLP actually to find a pre-trained model that's as useful as, or in fact, I think in this case, more useful than um, the image classification in image domain. So a bit of history. So one of the first successful tries was ELMO, which was released in um, November 2017. And this actually won the um, NACL 2018 best paper. So what ELMO did was actually quite simple. So their hypothesis was just like in the image domain, um, if we train language model on a large corpus and we actually fine tune that, or I mean, not necessarily fine tune it, but use that for the target task, then it will be more useful. It will make the accuracy higher. So what they did was they trained a language model, but uh, because they, want, they were focusing on classification task, then in this case, usually you want to be able to um, actually uh, your embedding wants to be, or your um, your model wants to be aware of the words, not just the that happened before, but also words that are um, that happening in future, right? So they actually train a language model in two directions. So it's important to note that the uh, four direction language model was trained independently of the backward language model, and then. Once these two language models were trained, they actually put this at the very, um, the first layer of the, the target task. So what that means is that, let's say that we have a target task, um, just like LSTM based uh, classification model, then you will have the model and the input, right? So uh, suppose that, your input is, and then this goes into this model. And then suppose this is classification, positive or negative. And then what Elmo did was, okay, let's just create a additional layer here. So there, idea was that, okay, before these word embeddings go into the model, we want to contextualize it enough so that the words are aware of the surrounding words better. 
this was the basic idea of Elmo. And of course, this red thing comes from, this layer is um, coming from the, these LSTM models, language models trained on large corpus, self-supervised. And they, they're also the point was that this M, which is target specific, is we're just gonna, they, they just use the off the shelf, still the, I mean, the state of the art models. Or um, even the, even though they were actually not state of the art, they just still used it. And um, they were able to actually increase the target, the, the model's performance so much that they were actually now winning the previous state of the art. So actually it's worth it, uh, it's worth taking a look at the paper. So um, I'm gonna actually show you the paper's results. So, you see the paper? So this is the paper that was actually uh, first, well, I mean, on the archive, it might seem like it was actually released in the February, but then um, this was uh, the, the they, they achieved the high score in the, um, in the squad leaderboards in November, 2017, and was from the AI2 and uh, University of Washington. And um, really the important part is the results, right? So here you go. So this is really the, the core results. So as you see, they have a target model, which was achieving 81.1%. And then they put this layer in between the word embeddings and the model, and they were able to increase the accuracy to 85.8%, which is like about 4.7% increase. And this is even higher than the state of the art, which was very specialized for the task. And they did the same thing in the SNLI, the classification task. Here, they didn't get much gain, but still it was a, a statistically significant improvement. In SRL, which is a token classification problem, labeling each token, your their baseline was 81.4, which was already very close to the previous state of the art. And then they were able to improve that by 3.2%, which was outperforming the previous state of the art by a large margin. In the core reference resolution, their baseline model was actually a state of the art back then. And then they were able to improve that by more than 3% as well. NER, token classification task, they were also able to achieve the state of the art. And SSD5, their baseline model was 51.4%. They were able to achieve 54.7, which is 1.1% higher than the previous state of the art. So, as you see, they create a single model I mean, or a single layer, pre trained layer that doesn't require even the, um, you know, some supervision. It was a self supervision. And then they were able to achieve the state of the art in every data set. I mean, in this paper, of course. Um, so this was very, very um, influential back then um, because it was clear that if you just actually attach this ELMO, what's called ELMO to any model that uh, people have made, then you can achieve the, you can increase the performance by two to five points easily. Of course, the, one of the issues was this, this LSTM is very heavy. They're very, um, they're a lot of, uh, well, it's actually a few layers and also it's also um, the dimension was very high. So it was not free lunch in that it required uh, additional comp uh, computational cost, but then still it was able to give a lot of boost. So that was actually a pretty good start in um, late 2017. Now coming back to the um, slides. But then, you, uh, then people wonder then, okay, can we, do we really need task specific components? 
Elmo was a contextual word embedding that gets inserted into the target model that's specialized for target task and then between the word embeddings between that. But then what people thought then is that do we really need the task specific layers because why not just use the output of the pretrained language model if it's really good? I mean, if it's really contextualized well, what is there to actually uh, model on top of it more, right? So that's what the, the ULM fit paper was about. It's actually less known than I think, I mean, it's it, it received a lot of uh, attention, but then I think uh, because of uh, whatever came after this, it I think doesn't, um, well, I mean, sometimes receive the attention it should, but what they did was they created a elastium language model, something similar to Elmo, but then what they focused on was not inserting this LSTMs into um, existing target, uh, ex existing models for a target task, but instead they just use this language model for the target task directly without any additional layer. And you basically do the language model pre-training and then you do the fine tuning with the same model with just a different layer at the, at the, um, at the last layer. We just add one layer to, for the classification. And it's worth noting that this was just for the classification. And well, they got pretty good results um, compared to, I think they had very good results in terms of uh, how they can, good they can be with the fuchsia learning. Although it wasn't really about achieving the state of the art in popular data sets. So it was limited. It wasn't um, the, it wasn't like a state of the art, but then it basically shined a possibility in um, using a universal single model for all the tasks, because in this case, they don't even actually have a change in the model. I mean, the model is not task specific. They share one model that was pre-trained or trained during language model for the language model, and then just change last layer for the target task. So I think I also encourage you to read this paper because it's very um, interesting, especially after you learn about all these advancements that happen after that. So, but then they were still dependent on LSTMs. And you see, Elmo was first introduced in November, 2017, although this was archived in the February, 2018. And ULM fit was, ULM, ULM fit was introduced in January, 2018. And remember that the transformer was first introduced to the public in May, 2017. So, and back then, of course, it was ma mainly for machine translation, but uh, during that uh, six to seven month, people were now seeing the power of the transformer in not just machine translation, but every different kind of language models, I mean, language tasks, and people were actually using this for different language tasks. So it was not super surprising, given these two very encouraging results. And Elmo was actually encouraging in that it achieves state of the art with this pre-training and ULM, ULM fit was very encouraging in that you don't need any target specific layers. So surely uh, influenced by these two models, what came after is GPT, which was released in June, 2018. So now you see something that's actually quite um, different from the previous two in three ways. Number one, from Elmo, they, I mean, actually from the ULM fit, actually um, two ways, actually, not three ways. Number one, well, now they changed to transformer, right? It's very, um, very uh, familiar architecture, self-attention, layer norm, fit for layer norm. And, and of course there is an ad uh, for the residuals. But then one thing is that because they were using this for the language model pre-training, 
they only have decoder because language model, we, we talk about this, right? A language model can only have decoder in the sig to sig architecture such as transformer, but then they still uh, use this transformers decoder to pre-train on language model. And then um, one another thing that was different in GPT was that they also wanted to tackle um, classification tasks for several inputs. And before GPT, when people had several inputs, they tried to create a task specific model that handles those inputs differently. For instance, um, they have some interaction layer between the two inputs. What GPT tried is, okay, why not just concatenate them all and they just indicate where the where they um, actually intersect, I mean, where they actually border each, each, each other. So in the just simple classification task, it's just very simple thing, text as an input, but then in the entailment or similarity or multiple choice task, there are several text inputs. So that's why they actually um, put, as you see, um, two text side by side with one delimiter, special token, basically that indicates where they um, border each other so that model will be able to utilize that information if needed. And that simplifies the model a lot. So it simplifies the model in two ways, right? Number one, just like ULM and FIT, they don't actually have any task specific layer. So it's just one model. And number two, they always have single stream of input instead of uh, multiple inputs, even if it's a task that requires, actually, I mean, task that has multiple inputs. So model is very surprisingly simple. They just have to tweak at the uh, last layer what they're trying to do. Of course, here, everything was classification. I mean, either it's text classification or entailment is also kind of classification, right? So it was great, but then, well, the GPT also received a lot of attention, but then didn't receive that much attention, mainly because GPT was actually tested on data sets that were not relatively popular. For instance, compared to Elmo. Elmo was, I, I think they were at least more of a, I think I would say they were more of NLP folks that they knew what NLP people are really interested in and think are really hard. Um, GPT was, on some data sets that people have never tried or people don't really know. So it was not super clear back then whether this is really meaningful. I think I was also one of a skeptical people who were thinking like, okay, this result is not probably that much meaningful because these data sets, like no one's really interested in these data sets. Or even when the data sets were what people were really interested, the gain was not that big. And that was actually one of the first, I think, um, OpenAI's work. And it's actually interesting to see that the OpenAI in the, um, if you actually, I also encourage you to read the blog, but then because at the end of the blog, they say that they trained on this single node, AGPUs, and they wanted to, they said the future work is scaling this up. Of course, back then they didn't have an idea what that would mean, but, um, Single node training was dominant back then. And even um, people wanted to try multi-node. Technology was not, well, I mean, was just emerging multi-node training. And that's why the every training environment was mostly single node. Some people actually, I mean, the image domain, people were starting to actually um, train with like two nodes, uh, three nodes, et cetera. But uh, most organizations didn't have the capacity or willingness to deploy the multi-node training. So that was the um, situation back then around, I will say um, June, 2018. That's only like three years ago, right? Well, except for one organization or maybe not just one, but then um, I think you can guess uh, it was Google back then that Google was actually just Google was just, just finished development of, I mean, just finished the deployment of uh, the, their tensor cores, the, uh, what do you call TPUs within the um, company for the research uses. So they were actually getting really large TPUs, number of TPUs um, within. And then around that time, 
they also got the, this transformer that was kind of transforming the NLP research. And at around that time in June 2018, a lot of researchers in Google were had the access to multiple TPUs and also um, multiple nodes and also um, di distributed training environment that can utilize multiple nodes. And I think that environment was really the crucial factor for the development behind, um, I guess everyone knows, I mean, many people know BERT, which was released in um, October, 2018. And this won the best paper in NACLA 2019. So 2018, NACLA 2018, NACLA is one of the uh, top tier conferences in NLP. So NACLA 2018, best paper went to Elmo and NACLA 2019, best paper went to BERT. So um, I think that's it for today. So we don't have class on Wednesday and I'm going to talk about BERT next Monday. So stay tuned. Um, so see you next Monday. Thanks.